Camino Rios lives for the summers when her father visits her in the Dominican Republic. But this time, on the day when his plane is supposed to land, Camino arrives at the airport to see crowds of crying people. In New York City, Yahaira Rios is called to the principal's office, where her mother is waiting to tell her that her father, her hero, has died in a plane crash. Separated by distance and Poppy's secrets, the two girls are forced to face a new reality in which their father is dead and their lives are forever altered. And then, when it seems like they've lost everything of their father, they learn of each other. Best friends Kate Garfield and Anderson Walker share a love of theater and crushes on the same guys. But when one of their long-distance crushes shows up at their school, real feelings might end their friendship. Huda and her family just moved to Dearborn, Michigan, a small town with a big Muslim population. In her old town, Huda knew exactly who she was. She was the hijabi girl. But in Dearborn, everyone is the hijabi girl. Huda is lost in a sea of hijabis, and she can't rely on her hijab to define her anymore. She has to define herself. So she tries on a bunch of cliques, but she isn't a hijabi fashionista, or a hijabi athlete, or a hijabi gamer. She's not the one who knows everything about her religion, or the one all the guys like. She's miscellaneous, which makes her feel like no one at all, until she realizes that it'll take finding out who she isn't to figure out who she is. Tyler Fader shares her story of her mother's first oncology appointment to facing reality as a motherless daughter in this frank and refreshingly funny graphic memoir. Mia is officially a troubled teen. She gets bad grades, drinks too much, and has probably gone too far with too many guys. But she doesn't realize how out of control she seems until she is taken from her home in the middle of the night and sent away to Red Oak Academy, a therapeutic girls boarding school in the middle of nowhere. While there, Mia is forced to confront her, her painful past at the same time she questions why she's at Red Oak. If she were a boy, would her behavior be considered wild enough to get sent away? But what happens when circumstances outside of her control compel Mia to make herself vulnerable enough to be truly seen? After a fatal car accident that reveals Emery's brother Joey's opioid addiction, Emery struggles to help him on his road to recovery and make herself heard in a town that insists on not listening. When Michael walks through the doors of a Catholic school, things can't get much worse. His dad has just made the family move again, and Michael needs a friend. When a girl challenges their teacher in class, Michael thinks he might have found one, and a fellow atheist at that. Only this girl, Lucy, isn't just Catholic. She wants to be a priest. Lucy introduces Michael to other St. Clair's outcasts, and he officially joins Heretics Anonymous, where he can be an atheist, Lucy can be an outspoken feminist, Avi can be Jewish and gay, Max can wear whatever he wants, and Eden can practice paganism. Michael encourages the heretics to go from secret society to rebels intent on exposing the school's hypocrisies one stunt at a time. But when Michael takes one mission too far, putting the other heretics at risk, he must decide whether to fight for his own freedom or rely on faith, whatever that means, in God, his friends, or himself. When Springville residents, at least the ones still alive, are questioned about what happened on prom night, they all have the same explanation. Maddie did it. An outcast at her small town Georgia high school, Madison Washington has always been a teasing target for bullies, and she's dealt with it because she has more pressing problems to manage, until the morning a surprise rainstorm reveals her most closely kept secret. Maddie is biracial. She has been passing for white her entire life at the behest of her fanatical white father, Thomas Washington. After a viral bullying video pulls back the curtain on Springville High's racist roots, student leaders come up with a plan to change their image. Host the school's first integrated prom as a show of unity. The popular white class president convinces her black superstar quarterback boyfriend to ask Maddie to be his date, leaving Maddie wondering if it's possible to have a normal life. 
but some of her classmates aren't done with her just yet. And what they don't know is that Maddie still has another secret, one that will cost them all of their lives. George M. Johnson, activist and best-selling author of All Boys Aren't Blue, returns with a striking memoir that celebrates black boyhood and brotherhood in all its glory. This is the vibrant story of George, Garrett, Rawl, and Rasul, four children raised by Nanny, their fiercely devoted grandmother. The boys hold one another close through early brushes with racism, memorable experiences at the family barber shop, and first loves and losses. And with Nanny at their center, they are never broken. George M. Johnson captures the unique experience of growing up as a black boy in America and their rich family stories, exploring themes of vulnerability, sacrifice, and culture, are interspersed with touching letters from the grandchildren to their beloved matriarch. By turns heartwarming and heartbreaking, this personal account is destined to become a modern classic of emerging adulthood. Charlie Vega is smart, funny, artistic, ambitious, and fat. People sometimes have a problem with that last one, especially her mom. The world wants Charlie to be thinner, lighter, slimmer-faced, straighter-haired, like her best friend Amelia. When Charlie starts a tentative relationship with cute classmate Brian, the first worthwhile guy to notice her, everything is perfect until she learns one thing. He asked Amelia out first. Does he really like Charlie, or is he just using her to get closer to Amelia? The world is not tame. Ashley knows this truth deep in her bones, more at home with trees overhead than a roof. So when she goes hiking in the Smokies with her friends for a night of partying, the falling dark and creaking trees are second nature to her. But people are not tame either, and when Ashley catches her boyfriend with another girl, drunken rage sends her running into the night, stopped only by a nasty fall into a ravine. Morning brings the realization that she's alone and far off trail. Lost in undisturbed forest and with nothing but the clothes on her back, Ashley must figure out how to survive with the red streak of infection creeping up her leg. In the near future, citizens can enjoy watching the executions of society's most infamous convicted felons streaming live on the Postman app from the prison island Alcatraz 2.0. D. Guerrera wakes up in a haze, lying on the ground of a dimly lit warehouse, about to be the next victim of the app, found guilty of murdering her stepsister. But D. refuses to roll over and die for a heinous crime she didn't commit. Her, new, her newly formed posse, the Death Row Breakfast Club, needs to prove she's innocent before she ends up murdered for the world to see. That's if the postman's class of cast of executioners don't kill them off one by one first. After 17-year-olds Chloe and Shara, Chloe's rival for valedictorian, kiss, Shara vanishes, leaving Chloe and two boys who are also enamored with Shara to follow the trail of clues she's left behind. But during the research, Chloe starts to suspect that there might be more to Shara and her small Alabama town than she thought. In a country governed by isolation, fear, and a tyrannical dictator, 17-year-old Christian Florescu is blackmailed by the secret police to become an informer. But he decides to use his position to try to outwit his handler, undermine the regime, give voice to fellow Romanians, and expose the world to what is happening in his country. When 17-year-old Nora O'Malley, the daughter of a con artist, is taken hostage in a bank heist, every secret she is keeping close begins to unravel. A family extending from Pakistan to California deals with generations of young love, old regrets, and forgiveness. Ryland Grace has been asleep for a very, very long time. He's just been awakened to find himself millions of miles from home, with nothing but two corpses for company. He can't remember his own name, let alone the nature of his assignment or how to complete it. 
alone on this tiny ship that's been cobbled together by every government and space agency on the planet and hurled into the depths of space, it's up to him to conquer an extinction-level threat to our species. And thanks to an unexpected ally, he just might have a chance. When an assignment given by a favorite teacher instructs a group of students to argue for the final solution, a euphemism used to describe the Nazi plan for the genocide of the Jewish people, Logan March and Cade Crawford are horrified. Their teacher cannot seriously expect anyone to complete an assignment that fuels intolerance and discrimination. Logan and Cade decide they must take a stand. As the school administration addresses their refusal to participate in the appalling debate, the student body, their parents, and the larger community are forced to face the issue as well. Jean understands stories, comic book stories in particular. Big action, bigger thrills, and the hero always wins. But Jean doesn't get sports. As a kid, his friends called him Stick, and every basketball game he played ended in pain. He lost interest in basketball long ago, but at the high school where he now teaches, it's all anyone can talk about. The men's varsity team, the Dragons, is having a phenomenal season that's been decades in the making. Each victory brings them closer to their ultimate goal, the California State Championships. Once Jean gets to know these young all-stars, he realizes that their story is just as thrilling as anything he's seen on a comic book page. He knows he has to follow this epic to its end. What he doesn't know yet is that this season is not only going to change the dragon's lives, but his own life as well. Cash lost his mother to an opioid addiction, and his papa is slowly dying from emphysema. Dodging drug dealers and watching out for his best friend and person of his heart, Delaney, is second nature. When Delaney makes a scientific discovery that gets them f both full rides at an elite prep school in Connecticut, Cash has to make a choice. Will he go with her to Connecticut or stay in Tennessee with the grandparents who saved him?